Tonight, Russia urged UN resolution demands Russia withdraw from Europe's largest nuclear plant. Historic rains, torrential rains devastate South Korea, killing and displacing thousands. Peace Mission 5.0, Viktor Orban meets Trump at Mar-a-Lago to discuss peace efforts amid Russia-Ukraine war. Robot Makeup, a more Pacific unwields AI-powered robotic arm system for custom-tailored makeup matching exact skin tones. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. is other there in a world news tonight Good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. We've got a plethora of fresh updates to bring to you tonight, starting off on our top story which centers on the latest UNGA vote against Russia. The United Nations General Assembly demanded Russia withdraw its military from the Ukraine's largest nuclear plant and the return control to Ukraine. The resolution passed with 99 votes in favour, 9 against and 60 abstentions as the plant remains shut down. The UN's 193-member General Assembly adopted a resolution in New York on Thursday with 90 votes in favour, 9 against and 60 abstentions, demanding that Russia urgently withdraw its military and other unauthorised personnel from Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and return full control of the facilities to the Ukrainian authorities. Throughout the war, Ukraine and Russia have accused each other of aerial strikes on Europe's largest nuclear power plant. The UN resolution called for immediate cessation of the attacks by the Russian Federation against critical energy infrastructure of Ukraine due to the risk of a nuclear accident or incident at all nuclear facilities of Ukraine. Southeastern Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant was captured by Russian forces in March 2022, in the early days of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Taking a look at European Germany's top security officials reported yesterday that the country will bar the use of critical components made by Chinese companies Huawei and ZTE in core parts of the country's 5G networks in two steps starting in 2026. Germany, Europe's largest economy, has decided to ban critical components from Huawei and ZTE in its 5G core networks by the end of 2026. Germany's Interior Minister Nancy Faeser announced that critical management systems from these manufacturers in 5G access and transport networks must be replaced by 2029. This decision follows recent negotiations with Deutsche Telekom, Vodafone and Telefonica which operates Germany's 5G networks. Agreements will be signed with all three companies as FASA emphasized the need to reduce security risk and avoid one-sided dependencies to protect Germany's communication infrastructure. Heading over to South Korea, the torrential downpours that swept the country's central and south regions that left five people dead and one person missing. Thousands of people had to evacuate, with many of them still not able to return home. Five people have died and one person is reported missing from intense downpours in the central and southern regions of South Korea. Torrential rain struck in the early hours of Wednesday, flooding homes and leaving residents stranded. In Chungcheongnam-do province, roads were flooded and one person died in the elevator of a building that had flooded up to the first basement level. With rainfall exceeding 110 mm per hour recorded in the central province, two more deaths were caused by landslides. In the southern part of the country, two people are reported to have lost their lives, with one person still missing. Gunsan City in Cholabukdo province saw the highest amount of rainfall recorded as rain there poured down at a rate of more than 130 mm per hour. The Meteorological Administration described the overnight rainfall as a record-breaking downpour that occurs once every 200 years. According to the government, hundreds of homes were damaged and more than 4,000 residents were evacuated nationwide. As the monsoon season continues, the government has stated its commitment to closely monitoring weather conditions and minimizing human casualties. With the heavy rain subsiding, the alert level of the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures headquarters was lifted on Wednesday night and the nationwide landslide crisis alert has been downgraded from serious to caution. However, due to continuous rain, the government has cautioned about the potential for landslides due to weakened ground conditions. 
The Korea Meteorological Administration forecasts cloudy weather in southern regions and rain in Jeju Island for the weekend. A newest update on the Kenyan situation, Kenya's president, William Bruter, has dismissed all his ministry and the attorney general following deadly protest against a tax bill. He stated that the decision came after reflection and listening to the Kenyans while the deputy president and prime cabinet uh, secretary, who is also the foreign affairs ministers, remain unaffected. Kenyan President William Ruto took the sword to his cabinet on Thursday. He dismissed everyone except his foreign minister after nationwide anti-government protests. I have today decided to dismiss with immediate effect all the cabinet secretaries and attorney general of the Republic of Kenya, of the cabinet of Kenya. The youth-led protests, sparked by planned tax hikes, which Ruto has since abandoned, have created the biggest crisis of his two-year presidency. At least 39 people were killed in clashes with the police, and some demonstrators briefly stormed parliament last month, before Ruto abandoned the new taxes. I will immediately engage in extensive consultations across different sectors. In a televised address, Ruto told the nation he was also dismissing the East African country's Attorney General, but said the Deputy President's office was not affected. With the aim of setting up a broad-based government. Last week, Ruto proposed spending cuts and additional borrowing in roughly equal measures to fill the nearly $2.7 billion budget hole caused by the withdrawal of the tax hike. Analysts say the rollback means Kenya is likely to miss international monetary fund targets, although the government does not have debts due. Let's take a short commercial break for more world news on the other side. On the road to the White House, President Joe Biden mistakenly referred to Vice President Kamala Harris as Donald Trump, but reiterated his commitment to his re-election campaign. At 81, Biden emphasized his extensive experience, asserting he's best suited to, the de to defeat Trump, who is 78 and led the U.S. U.S. President Joe Biden mixed up names and verbally stumbled at a press conference Thursday, one where he doubled down on staying in the race for the presidency and repeatedly emphasized that he was the most qualified to beat his Republican rival, Donald Trump. I'm in this to complete the job I started. Calls have tallied up by the day from the 81-year-old's Democratic colleagues to end his re-election bid over concerns about his age and mental acuity. His case may not have been helped early on in the hour-long Q&A when he mixed up the name of his vice president, Kamala Harris, with Trump. I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be vice president that I think she's not qualified to be president. So let's start there. That came a few hours after Biden mistakenly referred to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky as President Putin at the NATO summit in Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. <laughs> President Putin. You can beat President Putin. President Zelensky. Later at the press conference, his first responses were garbled, but grew steadier as he fielded questions from reporters. He said he had undergone a neurological exam as recently as February, but would take another if recommended to him by his doctors. I think I should have a neurological exam again. I'll do it. But no one's suggesting that to me now. Biden has faced growing doubts from donors, supporters, and fellow Democrats since his poor debate performance against former President Trump two weeks ago. They fear he no longer has the ability to beat Trump in the November election or to lead the country for another four-year term. So far, 16 Democrats in the House and one in the Senate have appealed publicly to the president to withdraw from the race. Officials from the United Auto Workers Union, which endorsed Biden in January, met on Thursday to discuss their concerns with his candidacy, according to three sources familiar with the matter. The union has a big presence in industrial states like Michigan, that Biden will need to carry to win re-election. Biden has vowed to continue on, and his campaign argued that the debate has not dramatically shifted the race, even as it laid out a narrow path to re-election. 
The campaign argued it could win by focusing on battleground states Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. If Biden took those states, along with others considered to be reliably Democratic, he would win 270 electoral votes, the bare minimum needed to secure the presidency. The campaign characterized other battleground states he won in 2020 as, quote, not out of reach. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban met with former U.S. President Donald Trump in Florida to discuss peace possibilities for the Russian-Ukraine war. Orban's recent visit to Kyiv, Moscow and Beijing on solo peace missions have angered Hungarian NATO allies. Hungarian President Viktor Orban visited former President Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago discussing a peace initiative for Ukraine. Orban's proposal has caused friction within the European Union, where Hungary recently assumed the rotating presidency. Known for his close ties with Russian President Vladimir Putin, Orban attended a NATO summit in the US hosted by President Joe Biden. Hungarian Foreign Minister stated that Hungary believes a second Trump presidency could bolster peace prospects in Ukraine. Orban's recent meeting with Putin in Moscow has raised concern among NATO members who aim to isolate Putin of the Ukraine invasion. As the newest update on the ongoing hurricane situation, torrential downpours in Vermont led to flash flooding and numerous water rescues, resulting in at least one fatality. Meanwhile, a possibility of tornadoes damaged homes in upstate New York. It may have been the remnants of Hurricane Barrel, but tonight areas of the Northeast are reeling from storm damage, like this possible tornado in upstate New York, ripping the roof off a home. Four tornadoes were confirmed in the state. Tornado right there. And reports of three more are being investigated by the Weather Service. In northern Vermont, torrential downpours overwhelmed rivers. Water raging through towns after some areas received more than six inches of rain in just a matter of hours. Flash flooding led to at least one death. The Vermont National Guard was called in to help with over 100 water rescues. Where the water receded, homes were left in ruin exactly one year after the same area weathered extreme floods. Now the governor says the state was ready, but it will take time. This morning, the downtown streets of Bar, Vermont, looked more like the canals of Venice, while roads and bridges are destroyed throughout the state, and the threat is not over. A storm that started as a hurricane in Texas, tearing a deadly path across the entire country. The Israeli military's initial probe into October 7th Hamas attack admitted failure to protect the community where over 100 people were killed and 32 taken hostage. The investigation revealed that day's events and security responses uh, with some detail previously reported by international media. Kibbutz Be'eri was one of the worst hit Israeli communities in the devastating October 7th attack by Hamas gunmen from the Gaza Strip. More than 100 people were killed in the attack on the community of about 1,000 people, and 32 members were taken captive back to Gaza, 11 of whom are still believed held hostage. And on Thursday, the Israeli military published the findings of a first probe into its own security failings, acknowledging it failed to protect the citizens of Be'eri. Israeli Army spokesperson Daniel Hagari. It is painful and difficult for me to say this. The Israeli Defense Forces should have defended the residents of Kibbutz Be'eri. But unfortunately, we were not there. For long hours of fighting, for hours, the residents of Be'eri defended their families with their bodies, alone, in front of the terrorists. The investigation found Israel's military was unprepared for the scenario of a massive infiltration of militants into Israel, had inadequate forces in the area, and did not have a clear picture of the events until hours after the attack began. The rampage through Be'eri and other Israeli communities near the border with Gaza killed 1,200 people, according to Israeli tallies. It was Israel's deadliest day and the worst attack on Jews since the Holocaust. The military presented its reports to Be'eri's residents, many of whom were relocated across the country to a resort beside the Dead Sea. 
Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant on Thursday called for a state inquiry into the security failings of the October 7th attack. He said the probe should investigate Gallant himself and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Gallant spoke at a military graduation ceremony with Netanyahu present. Netanyahu has dismissed past calls to form a state inquiry. Heading over to the UK, Britain's economy grew more quickly than expected in May, providing some momentum for the new government of Prime Ministers, Keir Starmer's, but adding to doubts about whether the Bank of England will cut interest rates next month. Yeah, good. Britain's new Prime Minister entered his job with a host of challenges, but he's also received two early gifts. England reaching the final of the Euro 2024 soccer tournament might temporarily lift the national mood in some parts of the UK. But Keir Starmer also inherited an economy which grew faster than expected in May. Official data released Thursday showed economic output increased 0.4% in May after a 0.2% rise in April. That was ahead of analyst projections. May saw a broad-based rise in economic output. Services and manufacturing both grew, while construction was up by 1.9% on the month driven by house building. Over the three months to May, the economy expanded by 0.9%, the strongest reading in more than two years. The new Labour administration wants to achieve the fastest growth among the group of seven advanced economies on a sustained basis. But while that may be a boost for Starmer, it's fueling doubts about the Bank of England's next move and whether the central bank will start cutting interest rates in August as previously predicted. The United Nations Population Division's update world population prospects of 2024. This is considered the most authoritative and accurate global projection pot, uh, population projection. Its medium variant predicts a population of 8.5 billion by 2030, exceeding 10 billion by 2061, peaking at 10.3 billion in the mid-2080s, before gradually declining. The report said that the current population of 8.2 billion will grow to 10.3 billion by the mid-2080s, and the figure is expected to return to around 10.2 billion by the end of the 21st century. At a press briefing on the World Population Prospect 2024 report, the UN Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development, Navid Hanif, said that the new data suggests the world's population in 2010, 2100, will be 6% lower or 700 million people fewer than calculations made a decade ago. Director of the UN DESA's Population Division, John Wilmoth, said it is due to several factors, including lowering fertility levels in large countries such as China. Wilmoth also added that by 2080, persons aged 65 or older will outnumber children under age 18. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. Customers have flocked the Imo Pacific AI Beauty Lab in South Korea, where robots custom mix face products and recommend lipstick colors. Users of the lab praise the personalized service, highlighting the value of AI generated skin reports and customers' foundations. Struggle to find cosmetic products in the right shade? This AI powered technology can help. The robot, made by South Korean cosmetics giant Amo Pacific, is able to analyze users' skin and create products tailored to their exact needs on the spot. In South Korea's capital of Seoul, this AI-powered makeup manufacturer scans skin using data gathered over 78 years of the company's history, Amor Pacific has said. The robot then recommends products from a range of some 205 different skin foundation shades and 366 different lip product colors. Kwon Yu Jin was recommended a new foundation shade thanks to AI. Traditionally, cosmetics were chosen through brand recognition, packaging, reviews and store staff recommendations. But that can offer limited options and often falls short of meeting individual needs or skin conditions. Now the market for using AI in beauty and cosmetics industries is forecast to more than double, from over $3.2 billion in 2023 to $8.1 billion in 2028. 
That's according to analyst provider business research company. This is expected as services expand, including personalised beauty recommendations, virtual makeup artists and skin analysis and diagnostics. And that concludes our World News Roundup for this evening. We'll return on Monday with more vital updates from around the globe. Stay tuned as Sina Mayadunne will be back shortly with Nike Business Report. Thank you for watching and good night.